Hopefully this won't be a letdown today, but I believe I've got an exciting message for you. And uh, again, what an honor to be with you guys. I really do feel uh, when I come here, I'm with family. And I hope you feel the same way and that uh, we're here to go into the glory of God together. Yes. And again, love to spend time with Pastor Bob and Debbie. After the introductions, I can't say anything snide or, <laughs> or uh, sarcastic, so I've got to watch myself this morning. But uh, we've had a great time so far being here, and I and, uh, hope you enjoy the word this morning. Uh, 2018, God gave me a word for 2018 back in December, which I'm not going to share this morning in detail. But 2018 is going to be a year of an ex- accelerated change. In fact, he showed me, I shared this at the, at the uh, Grace Advance this year. When you guys at the Grace Advance? You too? Uh, he showed me back in December a TV screen, much like this one, but it was actually an old CRT-looking screen, and the picture was all scrambled, and I couldn't make out a thing out of it, and I said, God, what are you showing me? And he said, what we're doing, uh, what I'm showing you is every station around being transmitted at one time on that same screen. And of course, how many know there's hundreds of stations coming through here right now, satellite, air stations, whatever, and... Uh, he said, because it's all being shown at one time, you can't keep up with all the change on the screen. So it's scrambled looking to you. And he said, 2018 is going to be a year of accelerated change. And change is going to take place so fast, you won't be able to keep up with it yourself. You'll have to call upon God for assistance. God, I can't do this. I feel like I'm overwhelmed. God, I need help. And God says, because you're going to get to the place you can't do it yourself then you'll be able to transition to depending totally upon God. In fact, I gave this example in Ghana. Let me see if I can find a helper here very quickly. Vince, come here a second. We'll use you. Now, Vince, just stop right there. And I'll lay this right here. I want you to see if you can jump from where you're at to over that notebook. He did it. (laughs) Now, step back to where you were. Now, I want you to stand right there now, and I want you to jump over this pulpit and land over on the other side. Go ahead, now. Go. On three. Thank you. That, that gave the example. Here's what I want to get at. Is when I said to jump from here to here, he knew he could do it of himself. He didn't say, God, help me. God, assist me. He just did it because he had that ability of himself. But if his life depended upon it, and I said, I need you to jump from there over this pulpit to the other side. He'd be saying, God, I need help right now. <laughs> Let your angels elevate me, lift me up, bear me up on angels' wings. Uh, he would be calling up on the promises of God to walk on water if necessary to get over that pulpit. And what God was showing me is, is, is we've been so used to depending upon our own bi- ability to work through our problems, our challenges, you know, to hang on till we get through. And we're coming to a place that hanging on is just not going to do it anymore. You're going to speak the word of God, stand on the word, and watch God deliver you and tell you what to pick up, what not to pick up, what to let take care of itself. Because so many changes are going to come at one time. You're going to need the spirit of God to to unwind and, and, and unravel everything for you. Did you follow that? So I had that word in, in uh, December. And I've always I've confessed all of my walk with God, at least for the past 25 years, uh, out of second corinthians chapter 12 i will come to visions and revelations of the lord can you guys understand my accent this morning uh, this morning because this got back from Ghana and i had to stop and ask that a lot i'm just checking out i'm in illinois for still a problem didn't know if i need bob to translate or not <laughs> i confess i'm going to come to visions and revelations of the lord i've watched it happen and uh all of my walk with God pretty much I've had a lot of dreams and a lot of visions and some of them quite uh, to me profound for what God showed me 
he showed me actually the birth of Grace Ministries a year before it happened. He showed me the church we'd moved to, a vision and, and action, a dream, and what would take place. Uh, and this year, there's been an acceleration in my dreams and visions. I've had more dreams probably this, you know, in the past four months uh, than I've had in the past several years. Visions are increasing. And so I believe it's part of that acceleration. And I want to share with you something that came, took place out of a dream I had about three weeks ago. And uh, uh, I had a dream, and I knew it was a God dream when I woke up from it, woke up in the middle of the night with it. And in it, God, I'm not going to go through the details of the dream because we'd be here all morning trying to explain that. But in the dream, uh, God showed me he'd given me a master key that would unlock certain locks that other people couldn't unlock at least at the same time that I could. There was a timing involved in it. And he gave me this master key and uh, it let me access some blessings. In fact, in it, I was able to go into a store and get an RC Cola. I didn't realize it until I asked, I was explaining the dream to my uh, leadership. They said RC Cola, I forgot, was Royal Crown. And I was able to get a Royal Crown with that key. And uh, I believe, let me get to, to the the end of this I believe you all have that same key you're qualified for it to get the royal crown which is what we're going to go into and uh, is this on this is on there and so uh, in a second part of the dream I had a visitation of Jesus now I didn't see him but it was like he was downloading on me revelation and in all my years of dreams all my years of visit visions uh, I've had two dreams where I felt my emotions were elevated to a heavenly place that I've never, never experienced on earth. Uh, one was years ago, he showed me the end times and, and uh, I felt euphoria and love and peace like I've never known on earth. Then he said, I'm taking away the, the memory of everything I showed you because it's too great for your soul to, to, to hold on to, but I'm leaving you with the revelation or the memory of what you felt like in it. And what happened in the dream, he took me into his glory. And he left me with the feeling of the glory, but not the revelation of what was going to take place to get there. Well, now in these end times, he's starting to reveal, I believe what he showed me 25 years ago in this, in this dream, 27 years ago. And so uh, in this dream, I had a visitation and, and an emotional release like I had in that, in that first dream. And... Jesus showed me the condition of the churches in the world. He showed me the coming glory. He showed me the condition of the churches in the world. And he showed me who's going into the glory and who's not. And how many want to go into the glory of God? And he told me, without a doubt, not all churches are going into his end time glory. Now, Pastor Bob has mentioned it. I believe there'll be remnant people that will come out of those churches that will go in. But a lot of churches themselves won't go in. The pastor, I just think all churches are the same. We'll tell that to Jesus in the book of Revelation. Because he wrote seven letters of seven churches. You know, he, 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 he told John to write them. And five of the churches were in trouble. Three were in major trouble, about to lose their candle. Because they weren't, they weren't following the, the guidance of God in their church. And so it does matter where you go to church. And he showed me these churches. And he showed me the key to go into the glory was the master key, he said, that I was learning to, 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 to grab a hold of. And let me go ahead and tell you what the master key is because I know you can't wait to hear, right? Or should I wait till tonight to talk about the master key? The master key to go into the glory is to escape the normal church mindsets of the world. And versus just thinking you're going to heaven because you go to church and you're going to the glory because you, you confess you're a Christian. <laughs> it just happens. It's okay. At least it wasn't my wife this time. <laughs> and he said the master key is, is having a deep relationship with Jesus so intense that God can go down to the deep places within you and show you things that are holding you back. And you're willing to make changes as God shows you necessary change. Uh, I know one of the things he's worked on me with is trying to deliver me from any levels of pride with anything. 
If I try to get over into pride, uh, it's like the Spirit of God says, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? What have you done? You know, and he's trying to, he's trying to extract that from us, from self-sufficiency. That's one of the things about 2018 is self-sufficiency. That's a form of pride. I can do it myself. I don't need to call upon God now. And God's doing a deep work to deliver us from any type of things that will set us off. In other words, here's another one he always asked me for some time. If something starts to frustrate me, God would stop me and say, what inside of you had a problem with that? Why would an external activity cause in you an inward reaction? Did you follow me on that? Why did what your wife said bother you? Amen. Why did what your children did, why did that bother Why did somebody who you don't even know say something and now you're upset about it? Why, how could a Facebook post get you off balance? Now, that would never happen to me. I would just kind of, through word of knowledge, trying to extend out. and no, I'm just teasing. And God's trying to uproot out of us anything that would cause us to get offended or off balance, cause us to be bitter or unforgiving, because he's taking pure vessels purged by the word into his glory. Amen? And game players aren't going in. Those that won't let God get personal with them. You know, you, you cannot go to God when he says, I need you to change this and say, well, that's just the way I've always been. It's the way I've always felt. He's not going to let you get away with it in these end times. He's wanting to root out these things out of our life. And God said, that's the master key to go in. And then he showed me all these churches of the world. And he said, one of the major problems with churches in the world is instead of targeting going into my fullness, they're in competition with one another. They're trying to compete for the most people. Uh, whether you know it or not, well, you do know this. If you tell somebody about your church, usually their first question is, how many people are in your church? And I usually say all of them. At least, <laughs> usually once a week. <laughs> because it's not about how many. That's a competitive mindset. It's about what's in your people. What are, they, what are they doing to advance into the, thing, into the things of the kingdom? And so people always want, especially a pastor, how many people go to your church? And it's like a competition. You know, how nice a building do you have? Where's your location? Uh, uh, what kind of worship team? And, and we, we start to want to look at what other churches are doing and try to say, well, they've got it better now. I need to improve that. Do they have a soup kitchen? I need a soup kitchen. Do they have an evangelism program? I need an evangelism program. And we start to look at other churches to guide our steps versus hearing God what he would have us do. Do you follow me on that? And he says, those churches with a competitive mindset cannot go into the glory. And he says, because a competitive mindset is a result of, of believing you're living in a limited system. See, you compete because you think there's limited resources available. But there's plenty of people around here to fill every church in town to overflowing. There, God has the cattle on a thousand years. There's no lack of money. But we think we have to compete for people because that represents money. You know, it's a natural mindset. If I have 50 people now and my income is this high for the church, if I get 100 people, maybe it will do double. Well, that's looking at people as a source. And you're trying to compete to recruit people Versus just go after God and let the anointing bring in the harvest. And you're living by works and not by faith. So he showed me these different churches. So I want to draw a chart on here to start with. Let me grab some markers here. And uh, what I want to do is I'll draw an axis here. We're going to call this the presence of God. And up here, the, 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 what would we call the epitome of God's presence would be his glory. Whoops, do you understand that? Here's the glory at the height. This axis, now this is just our preliminary chart, is time. And our goal as a church 
should be for go from where we're at into the glory of God. So this would be, I mean, right here, here's rapture time. Harvest time, whatever you want to call it. I believe there's a harvest coming in, a wealth inversion, a rapture taking place, all in the same time frame. And in this chart, if you read charts well, notice the presence through time toward the end accelerates rapidly. In other words, a whole lot's being done in a short time, which is Romans 9.25. He's going to cut the work short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make up on the earth. God is accelerating our spiritual development right now. Because as I say in my church, we have a long way to go to get to the glory and a short time to get there. Now watch old bandit run. Uh, <laughs> you'd have to be a little older to understand what that just meant. Amen. So I tell my church, we've got a long way to go, a short time to get there. We don't have time to play. It's time for concentrated uh, emphasis on the kingdom, uh, development, letting God move upon you. It's not time to think you can just go to church every week and do the same thing over and over again. You're going to get there. Amen. And so he showed me this is the plan we're to go on. So, you know, we could call that. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But he showed me all these other churches in the world. And he showed me they're in competition. And instead of advancing toward the glory, they're advancing towards targets God was never even focused upon. Primarily head count, finances, facility, who's got the nicest church bus, you know, who has the, who has the best TV presence or the radio programming and you know, and, and we walk around like, yes, I'm on TV three days a week. I'm on TV seven days a week. Well, my shows a competition mindset within the kingdom of God. And because they're not targeting the glory, because this is, you know, this is the, uh, this is the glory point, I call it. They're not targeting the right goal. They're targeting wrong things. Instead of advancing upward, they're staying relatively flat. And so, uh, I'll define some of these churches we get into this very quickly. For example, uh, one church we might talk about would be the, the legalistic churches that are law, holiness, uh, uh, no move of the Spirit really, but you know, here's what you've got to wear, here's what you've got to do, here, can you have a TV, can you wear makeup. And so we might have one church way down here with no anointing, just a bunch of rules, so we could call this the law church. And let me open my notes here. Then also, we've got what I call the hellfire fear-based churches who try to scare people into the kingdom. You know, their target is, hey, we've got to get everybody saved. Let's get everybody in the church. And understand, that's a good thing to get everybody saved. But Jesus intentionally ran off the multitudes. Do you remember in John chapter 6? He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And, it's, and he knew that was a hard saying. He said it on purpose. Because when they left, he said, you're only here for the free happy meals. You just want the free food. He said, you've got no part with me. You've got to be willing to eat and, and, and drink every, all the essence that I am. And he ran off people without a heart for his fullness. Do you follow me on this? It's not about building the biggest congregation. Although I'm convinced God's bringing a harvest in the end times. Amen. I believe before it's done, there'll be more people in the kingdom of God than there will be in hell. God's going to win this. Yes. But there's a remnant they are going to step into the glory before all of this takes place. At least some level of the glory. And so here we have, we'll call this the fear church. And then as well, we also have uh, what is a big thing would be the user-friendly church. It's even swept through what we would call the charismatic church church in other words we don't want to scare anybody off we want to make church easy let's don't have services too long 
And let's don't talk about anything that, you know, may stretch them too far about faith or about tongues or about miracle power. Let's make it as easy as we can. What are they targeting, targeting when, you, when you create a user-friendly church? Head count and being liked in the community. So now we have, let's just call this, here's the user-friendly church. And we could go through here and start intertwining all the different churches that exist. You know, there are churches you just go to and, and, and do your duty to God. And, you know, they may feel a tingle of God, they may not. In fact, what God showed me was, is that these churches have a presence limit. We could call it a glory limit. That they may bounce around here and have a service where, you know, they feel the presence of God, they feel a tingle. Oh, God showed up and, you know, some people came to the altar or whatever. But they're, because they're not learning to go above a certain level in faith and into the kingdom, there's a limit of what they can really experience. And so they bounce around. God showed up and then God didn't show up. And, and God showed me all those churches intertwined, competing one with another, trying to outdo one another. And God said they're not going in. And he said, the churches that are going in are churches that are focused on the kingdom. In fact, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But we struggle for many years, what do we call our churches in Grace Ministries? Are we a charismatic church? Not really anymore. Are we a word of faith church? Definitely, but I believe it goes beyond a word of faith. Because a lot of word of faith churches aren't really going into a lot of the uh, anointings and the gifts and such. Uh, I think we're a kingdom church. In fact, I wrote down a name. I don't remember what it is. But it, it, we're kingdom oriented, kingdom focused, kingdom targeted churches. And God says, only those churches that are learning to, learning to flow in and live in my kingdom. To separate from the natural realm and natural church activity and learn to really believe for my promises and power and gifts and the flow of the Holy Spirit going into the glory. I believe this church is qualified. How about you? Amen. We're targeting the full counsel of God. I want everything that God has for my life. So then, hopefully I haven't gotten too bogged down in this part. I just got back from Africa. Hey, do you want to get this for me? Yeah. I'll make you designated eraser. I just got back from Africa last week, but I was going to do a leadership conference, and they told me the theme of the conference was, uh, I just forgot the link, a test of loyalty. And so I had some idea what the pastor meant. He wanted me to teach on divine order, submission to your pastor, covenant, and so in preparation, I uh, took my whole folder on divine order. I put a bunch of covenant notes in. I thought, I'm going to go and I'll teach covenant, teach divine order. And before the conference started, I taught in three different churches, three straight nights, and uh, had great services. But the conference was to start last Friday morning. And uh, the night before, I went to pull out my notes on covenant to study to figure out what I was going to teach what aspects of it and all of a sudden God showed me another direction to go dealing with that dream he'd given me with all the churches competing with one another and so I started making notes and, and, and writing down and uh, listing and it turned out I didn't get to sleep till six in the morning I tried to I would lay down had a light switch by, right by the head, head of the bed. I'd lay down. My mind wouldn't stop revelating. Have another thought. I'd have to turn the light back on, write it down. This went on all night. And out of it, uh, God gave me a chart of the growth development process of the church that I believe we're to be on. How many like charts? How many hate charts? <laughs> 
Hopefully you like this one. Amen. <laughs> but he would be a Ford fan, what can I say, you know? Now, we talked about that, that line going to the glory a while ago was, was a, a kingdom-focused line. Now, we've always called ourselves Word of Faith primarily. But Word of Faith deals with just living by the Word and living in the promises of God. But a lot of times I've been to Word of Faith conferences and meetings and they focused on the Word, but they left off the, the part, the, really the moving of the Spirit at any high level. And the Lord said it takes both. You've got to be a person of the Word and a person of the Spirit to go in. If you try to live by, well, I'll get to get in a second. You can't try to move in one without the other. And so I'm going to draw another chart here. And I'm going to call this the Spirit. And we could even put Spirit led. And I'm going to call this The Word. Now with the Word, when I say the Word, we could include the Word is also reference to the promises of God, right? So here's also the promises of God. It's also, uh, how many know Jesus said, Thy Word is truth. It's also the truth. How many know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word? This is also the axis that represents your faith. So for a person to be on this chart, uh, this axis represents he's grown in his revelation of the word. We'll just say out here is, is a... Revelation. Your, your perceived revelation of the Word of God, how high it is. So it's the realm of the Word. It's the realm of living in the promises of God. I mean, oh, God's exceed, got exceeding great and precious promises. It's the realm of living in truth. In other words, living in the kingdom of God, living in the truth that you know. And it's also the realm of living by faith. The vertical axis is how much your spirit led. How much is the Spirit of God active in your life? So this is also the realm of the gifts it's the realm of the anointings it, it could even be said it's the realm of love walking in the love of God to some level and so God started showing me how both of these are required to go into the end time glory now to go to the glory We'll call this 100% spirit-led. 100% in His anointing, 100% in everything He's made available to us from a spiritual standpoint. Are you following me on this? So, and He showed me that to walk in 100% revelation of the Word and walk in 100% of being spirit-led leads you to the same glory point. And I want to define different regions of this chart. Now, let me, let me give an example. Let's say that you're a church that's way down here. You're low in being spirit-led. But it, this would mean maybe out here, you're very high in your revelation of the Word. Up here, either you think you are or you desire to be or you're attempting to be led of the Spirit or operating in great levels of the gifts, but you're low in the Word. Do you follow me? And God showed me if we'll learn to advance in our revelation of the Word and be led of the Spirit, you'll enter a region up here of the manifestation of the glory. And I call this, I don't know if you can read this or not from where you're sitting. These new markers are really nice. This is the bride zone. How many know the bride is going to manifest the glory of God? Now, the rest of the church may follow later, or much of it, but there's a bride that's made herself ready. You're here this morning making yourself ready. You're, you're, you're letting God develop you.
to be a carrier of the end time glory of God. So the bride is up here in a region that is very high in the revelation of the word and very high in their being led of the spirit. Very high in carrying the anointings of God. Amen. And when you're in that realm, the gifts of God come automatically. They'll just happen. Amen. But then he showed me there's another region down here that this may be the churches. Let me see if I can define this. At this point, the only word they really know is they are saved by grace. They have a revelation of salvation. Do you understand? And they know when they're saved, they are indwelt. Can you guys read that from where you're at? By the Spirit of God. I mean, uh, I went to many churches before I got into the, the, the uh, ministries we're in now. And they understand that we're saved by faith in the Word. They understand when you got saved, the Spirit of God came inside of you to become the teacher and the comforter. But that was all they knew. They didn't believe in speaking in tongues, many of them. They didn't believe the gifts of the Spirit existed anymore. They didn't believe in the apostle and the prophet anymore. So what had happened is, is they had cut off the revelation they were able to walk in. First of all, I'm convinced if you don't speak in tongues, if you don't have a prayer language, not trying to pick on anybody, it highly limits the revelation you can move into. Because when you pray in the Spirit, you're speaking mysteries unto God, and it comes back as revelation of the Word. Amen. So what it is, they have cut off, they have limited how much they can grow into the glory. And I call this... the dead church. Now I'm gonna, not going to assign denominations to these, but... I'm going to assign some make-believe numbers that I would estimate. I would estimate personally that probably 40% of Christianity falls into this, into that category. They believe you're saved by grace. They believe that the Spirit of God's come inside of you, but then they don't know how to hear it. They don't know how to walk in the promises of God. They just go to church and try to be a nice person. And I believe... All of these may be saved if they truly trust in Jesus for their salvation. They're trying to live, you know, a somewhat sin-free life. Now, this doesn't include multitudes that call themselves Christians that are living in sin. It doesn't include multitudes that think just because they eat a cracker on Sunday, they're going to heaven. These would be evangel evangelicals that really understand salvation to some level, and the Spirit of God will come inside of you. Do you, do you understand what I'm talking about here? So this is what I would call the dead church. In fact, let me re I wrote the wrong word up there. So we can be consistent. This is the dead zone. You're dead as far as your growth in Christ. And hopefully you make it to heaven. But then there's another church on top of that. In fact, you might even define it as much of charismania today. The charismatic church. Where they recognize they can pray in the Spirit, but they don't hardly ever do it. They recognize they've been freed from tradition, but they don't go into a whole lot of the liberty of Christ or into the, into the full revelation of the Word. And they're not much different than the evangelical church without tongues, other than they, just, they believe in some of the gifts. And so I would draw their line. Let me just draw this in. Are you with me? Right here, and they have a little more uh, revelation of the Word. They operate in a little more of the presence of God. You know, they can praise God and the Spirit of God will show up and they'll see some things. But they're not going into living into the kingdom. In fact, most have compromised the Word of God and compromised uh, uh, moving into God because they want to remain to some level user-friendly. Well, if we start moving out and praying in tongues, people will think we're crazy and we'll run people off. And we just pay for this big building on it. It's got a big note on it. We can't afford to run people off. So let's dial it back a bit. Nobody prophesied publicly. And, you know, 
certainly don't lay hands on people in front of her where they start falling out because then people leave through the front door in droves. Do you follow me? So they want a move of God. They just don't want too much move of God where it frightens people. So I call this the tingle zone. Just give me a tingle of the Holy Spirit. Not too much, because that scares me. In, 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 in my city, where I'm at in Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, there are several charismatic churches. Quite a few. And their members at times will come to my church. And then all of a sudden, the gifts will start moving out, and people will be being prayed for, being healed. They'll fall out in the Spirit. Uh, maybe somebody prophesies or, or maybe you read their mail. And they say, well, you know, you're different from our church. We don't do all of that. Um, my question is, why not? Because as in the Word, we're to be functioning in the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God. And then the President God comes in in power and they're going like, what is this? Even though they go to a charismatic church, they don't know the intense presence of God. And they get scared and, and most have not come back. But a few with a real hunger will say, I don't care what i got to go through. I'm, I want the things of God. And they're after a tingle. Not after the full move of God. Now, up here is another zone. Now in this zone, these are people that desire to function in all the gifts of the Spirit. They want to walk in all this love of God. They want to... They want to have offices, they want to, uh, uh, in their mind, believe that they're going to walk in God's presence all the time. But they don't have a very high word level. And even if they know the word, they're not submissive to the word. So they're trying to operate in the full power of God without the word to be their foundation. Do you follow me? How many know the Word is always a foundation for everything we do? Uh, I don't care how, move, how far you move up in the Spirit, the Word must be your foundation. Otherwise, you'll fall prey to deceiving spirits. You know, all of a sudden, you know, you'll be like Alexander Dowie and think that you're uh, Elijah. Because you lift off walking as the Word being the final say in your life. And so these are a group, and I know many churches like that. I call them anything goes churches. Whoever has a song, sing your song. Who, you know, whoever's a prophecy, give your prophecy, even though it doesn't match the word. And we don't believe in pastors. Whoever has, you know, a revelation, bring your revelation. Totally leaving divine order and the word behind. And uh, they think they're walking in love. They think they're spirit led. But instead, they're actually, in most cases, def uh, uh, demonically led spirits have come in and said that they are God or the Holy Spirit that are leading them astray and all of a sudden they can marry some disball who's not even in church well God told me to marry him well the worst is to be un not to be unequally yoked so we have a problem here you follow me you're, you're opening yourself to deceiving spirits and so I don't have time to get bogged down in this because we got a long way to go in it short time to get there <laughs> I call this the flake zone <laughs> amen or we could call it granola Christianity you know what granola is right nuts fruits and flakes <laughs> So we could call this a granola zone. I mean, just... And you've met these ones. They walk around like, Oh, yes, I just walk with Jesus. But where do you go to church? Oh, I don't believe in the church. I just do whatever God tells me to do. Well, you're walking in a delusion. Amen? And so we're covering some of the different zones. So where do you think we should go next? Why don't we do this corner? Now this church, or this... Christian mindset is a church that understands a lot of the word <coughs> they can quote scriptures front to back in the Bible uh, but there's no leading of the spirit there's no refreshing of the spirit there's no being spirit led it's all led by what the word says 
And because there's no leading of the Spirit, they become very legalistic. Do you follow me? They live by law. Here's the rules of our church. Here's the rules of our denomination. And even though they think they understand 100% of the Word, they don't really understand the fullness of the revelation of the Word. But they're out here trying to live by law instead of by a relationship with Jesus. Amen. In fact, many of these churches don't even believe that you can hear God anymore. He gave us the Word. We walk by the Word. If you hear voices, it's not God. So I call this the legalistic zone. Now let me draw some more lines in here as we continue to define this. I want to go from the borders of the tingle zone up here to the bride zone. And uh, also to here. My graph is not exactly... even, but you follow what I'm trying to get at here. And so here we have an area, let's define this area, that is trying to operate in much more, well, hang on a minute. I need to fill in an area right here. Here's a group that may not be fully flakes yet. They haven't totally passed over into <laughs> flakeology. But they think that they can ignore a lot of the directives of the Word and still walk in a high level of the presence of God. Do you follow me? In fact, they'll say things like, well, we just believe that, that God loves us and we believe we can walk in the love of God. But if you want to follow our doctrine, make sure you don't read any of the red in the Bible. Have you heard of this one before? Or make sure you don't read any of the Old Testament because that's law and we're under grace now. And they believe, because they're under grace, that God will never convict them of sin again. They can do what they want, and it doesn't matter because they're loved by God and they walk in love. And in truth, they're walking in a delusion. And this would be, I'm sure some of you could fill it in, would be hyper grace. How am I doing for time? Here's our Hyper Grace Church. This is the Joseph Prince movement. Creflo Dollar got into this. And whatever you want to do, you know, I heard Creflo's turning back to truth again. I don't know, but I, I've, I've been told that. But this is just, you know, we've had too much legalism in the church, and we're free now. We just follow the Spirit of God, and we walk in love. And, but you've got to lay aside most of the Word that talks about certain things you can and can't do. So it doesn't matter if you sleep around. Doesn't matter if you know if 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 you're a liar. Doesn't matter if you cheat. Well, God can't see it anymore. Just know He loves you, because you believe in Jesus. Well, the devil believes in Jesus. Is he going to heaven? There's some stipulations to walk in the true love of God. Besides that, you need to read my book if you're going to do that. <laughs> so below hyper grace, here's a region. That you're trying to walk in the Spirit. I remember when I was young in church, I was trying to walk in the gifts of the Spirit. I wanted to move out in the power of God and, you know, experience all of this. And some with a little bit more understanding than me, been saved a little bit longer, said, you know, it's more important just to seek God first and then He, you know, learn the Word and God can bring you into the gifts. Build a foundation on the Word first. So these are people in this area, they're actually functioning in a higher level of the gifts, or they're trying to, then they're focused on the Word. In other words, the anointing comes before the Word. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because all of a sudden, it's more important you function in a gift or you prophesy. And it doesn't matter if your prophesy matches up to the Word, it's important you function in these gifts. That you be led of the Spirit. And I hear these voices, or I hear this, I, I, I feel this direction, but it doesn't line up to the Word. You need to cast it down. But what happens when you're up in here, you're not casting down like you need to cast down. You're more desirous of, the, of, of to flow in the Spirit than you are to bring your life in submission to the Word of God. Do you see this? And even though you haven't flaked yet, maybe you haven't given way to hyper grace, this is a very dangerous place to try to operate. Because there are many voices out there. And they're trying to get you to buy into a deception 
So I call this the deception zone. I've got a ways to go yet. Do I have time this morning? I didn't look at the clock. And uh, so there's the area. You're in danger. This is the deception zone. And if you find you're trying to function in that area, you need to get more back into the Word to bring balance into your life. I'm not talking about balance as compromise. I'm talking about balance between the Word and moving in the Spirit. Do you see? In fact, let me draw another line here. And I want to draw this line. On this line, it's a perfect balance between how much word you have revelation of and how much of that word you're walking in. See, if I draw a spot here, and I say I'm right here on the chart, that means I have a revelation of that much word. Do you see that? And it also means I'm walking in that equivalent level of being led by the Spirit. And as you go up the chart, when you keep this balance, it means you're walking in what's been revealed to you. Which is, you can't get any better than that. Because you certainly shouldn't be trying to walk in what's not been revealed to you yet. So what this is, because this is your level of truth. Remember this axis is truth? This is your level of truth that, you're, that you have revelation to. Here's your level of walking in truth. So this center line, I call the integrity line. You cannot walk in integrity in what you don't know is truth. And what this means is you're being honest to walk in the word that you know. This could also be your love development line going up the center. Now up here is you're, you're out of bounds a bit. And you've got it into a zone, there's a threat of deception. What about down here? In fact, let me go ahead and focus on this one just for a minute. I'll split this one in two. And I've made it into two different groups. Now, In this zone, we're trying to function in gifts somewhat above our level of walking in the Word. And you want to have an exciting service, you want to see some of the power of God, but you're not really focused on the Word of faith, you're not focused on the promises of God, and really, that's where much of the charismatic church is today. They're trying to function in the gifts, but they're not really focused on the Word. And definitely not trying to work by faith. It's more about excitement more than it is integrity to the Word. So I call this a zone. Is this okay with you this morning? Of charismatic chaos. Charismatic chaos zone. That is, again, a lack of integrity to the Word of God. Not really knowing the promises of God. Not knowing how to walk by faith. See, if we don't learn to walk by faith, we can't really manifest anything of God on a reliable or consistent basis. So here you're in and out of the things of God, in and out of the things of the Spirit, and are in very high level of danger of being deceived. I forget what the number was. Something like 300. But Elaine Homer says she personally knows I think it was over 300 ministers, not Christians, ministers, call of God and anointed of God, who have fallen into deception, who have fallen from their calling because they're trying to function up here without corresponding total reliability upon the Word of God. Because, see, if you're going to function high levels of being spirit-led, the enemy's going to try to interrupt your life and say, but you need to do this. You've got to say, no, it is written. You remember when Jesus was tempted of the devil? The enemy was trying to use the word to get him off base. To, to get him out of, out, of, out of bounds. But Jesus always responded with, it is written. He refused to let us call and get him off of the word. And we've got to be the same. 
I had a challenge here earlier this week where I had an attack against my mind that was trying to that was really trying to move me off of uh, uh, commitments I made in covenant that was trying to get me to question those and uh, in the midst of the attack I said I don't care what happens I will not violate the word of God in my decisions I will not violate what I've committed to and covenant in my decisions. And I'm not going into what happened, but what I'm saying is it was such a strong attack, it was trying to get me to disconnect from this on behalf of this. And I said, I would rather go clear back to no, no office, no position, no anointing, and stick to the Word than get up here in that deception zone. Do you follow me? You've got to refuse to go up there. That's why it's so important we have both a prayer life and a word life. Never confess I don't get anything out of the word. It's your foundation. It's the representation of Jesus in your life. And you've got to be grounded in the word to go anywhere into the glory. And so, here's the chaos, charismatic chaos realm. And there are churches, I don't know how it is here, but I know in, in the south, there's charismatic chaos everywhere. Everybody now has a projector. They show the wall, you know, on the wall or the TVs. And there's lights flashing and playing striper and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, yes. I do have a confession to make this morning. I really like that song. I don't think I could worship to it. But I can certainly get happy with it. And I'm going to play it when I get home. So, I'm going to play the whole album. So, uh... Great words of the song too. But there's there's so much effort to try to substitute here's here's the key. Because the charismatic church doesn't really know the anointing of God. They're trying to substitute it with excitement. With inner you know, soulish energy, mo momentum in the soul realm versus versus in the spirit. And so it's it's a very dangerous area to be. Now up here in this area. This is all, in fact, I should have cut that off. This is all part of the deception zone. Up here is a person flowing in a whole lot of the, of the anointing of God. A whole lot of the, of the presence of God, the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, they're flowing at such a high level, chances are they have a public ministry. They have a seen ministry. They've moved so high in the realm of functioning in the Spirit the chances are they're no and they have enough word to sustain it to a level but they don't have enough word to sustain where they're operating in the spirit let me give you an example of this I mentioned this a while ago you remember John Alexander Dowie he founded Zion Illinois 140 years ago or so he was one of the greatest healing miracle workers in the history of of the world people flock to hear his word and to see the miracles that that he functioned in does anybody know who John Alexander Dowie is read read John God's generals he's he's like the number one one that's, that starts off and he functioned so much of the power of God finances flooded him people flocked to him he had he had Timothy's and people he was training up all over the place and he decided he would start his own city he founded Zion Illinois I think just outside of Chicago north of Chicago, to be a haven for Christianity. And he came to the place that so many people were admiring him and complimenting him, he became convinced that he was Elijah. Resurrected. Totally lost his connection to the Word. And it caused great damage to the body of Christ. Uh, William Branham. You guys know who William Branham is? One of the most powerful healing ministers of the last century. Back in the 40s, miracle after miracle. People being raised from the dead. People uh, uh, healed left and right. In fact, he was killed in a car wreck. Uh, in a head-on collision. He and his wife both went through the windshield, if I remember right. And his wife was killed instantly. He wasn't. When his son came on the scene, William Branham said, How is your mother? He said, She's dead. He said, put my hand on her. He was busted up so bad. He didn't live, but he was still alive. He, he, he had his hand laid on his wife's 
on his wife's dead body. She was raised from the dead. He ended up dying. Yet his doctrine was so absolutely stupid, so outrageously crazy, that it became a laughing stock in, in, in the church. Because he became so deluded in what he believed was going to take place in the church and who he thought he was. And he was crazy. So he had a major public fall. And we could go on and if you've, if you've ever read Robert Slurden's book, God's Generals, about these great men of faith, half of the, of the great men of faith fell. Uh, John Wesley Fletcher, A.A. A. Allen had challenges. Uh, Jack Coe, pride, took him down, died at a young age. And so what this is, these are people that have a great scene ministry functioning in high power, but they don't let the word still be the final say. They get off base. So this becomes... Let me write this in a different color. The zone of public collapse. We could even say it's a zone of, 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 of public hypocrisy. That you're proclaiming the word in your life, but yet you're not living the word. And of course, even the thought of Jimmy Swagger comes to mind to some level. The word doesn't become your final say and you fell prey. And so, these are different zones that I believe Christians are functioning and churches are functioning. How about down here? Still with me? Now down here... This is stuff I stayed up all night a week and a half ago writing down. Down here is the zone where you're functioning in a lot of word, but you're not living led of the Spirit in that word. In other words, you know a lot of the Scripture, but you're not applying it. Or you know a lot of the Scripture, and you're not applying it being refueled by the Spirit of God. How many of the Spirit of God refreshes us? So what happens down here is, is... You've got a lot of words you're trying to walk in. You're trying to believe for all these things. You're trying to function in the Word. But you don't have the Spirit of God sustaining you. And you dry up. Does anybody know what I mean by that? You're trying to serve God. You're out there doing the Word. You're trying to, you know, lead the people to Christ. You're trying to shut down this sin or that sin in the community. And you're trying to, you know, uh, uh, be as good a person as you can to, to fulfill the Word of God in your life. But you don't have the Spirit of God as anointing, energizing you for it. So this becomes the burnout zone. You're ready to burn out. And I lived there for a long time. When I first got saved, I was so into the Word, I thought praise and worship was a waste of time. I would even, a lot of times, think, I don't want to go to church on time. I'm going to wait till praise and worship over and walk in for the Word. I know none of you have ever done that. Because I'm an engineer, I'm a logical thinker, I want the knowledge. I don't want to waste all the emotional, you know, time and emotional activity. Give me the Word. And what happened is I was full of word, but I didn't know how to refresh by the Spirit. And I'm doing all this stuff for God. And it just about wiped me out years ago. Trying to work for Jesus, suffering for Jesus, carrying my cross for Jesus. And it's an area of, of danger of burnout. Now I divided this in two parts, just for your entertainment. Down, or we'll start with up here. Up here is a zone where you have a lot of word in your actually you're accessing some of the anointing but not enough anointing to really sustain all the stuff you're trying to do for Jesus I mean you're trying to again witness you're trying to work at the church you're trying to minister here and you're whatever and and you just don't have enough time in praise and worship a time getting refueled that you're refreshed in it and you're believing for all these promises of God but you don't have the Spirit of God refreshing you for it. That, that you're doing much of it out of your own strength. Out of your own effort. And I call this... Let me change colors. The 
raw faith zone. See, there's a place in, 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 in church, in the kingdom of God, where you can get filled with the Spirit, you can learn to flow led of the Spirit, and when you're believing for a new promise of God, it's not hard. You just flow in it. Well, by his stripes, I was healed. Praise God, I receive that right now. And you just believe the word, you speak it, and you go on, knowing you have it. But when you're in the raw faith zone, because you don't have that spirit confirmation inside, you don't have that re-energizing, here's how you believe. I believe by his stripes, I'm healed. I'm healed by the according to 2 Timothy 2, I'm healed, and he took all my sick, and you confess it 3,000 times, walking the floor, stomping. Because you really don't know who you are in Christ fully. And you're not flowing in the Spirit. There's no peace in it, no relaxation. And you're working it. And you do that long enough, you will burn out. You've got to be a person that learns how to... I've learned, I learned this the hard way. You've got to learn to be a person who can go in and shut everything out. Turn on the worship music, however loud you're comfortable with. And get into the presence of God. And say, God, refresh me right now. And let worship re-energize you. And then it sustains you to move from this zone up into this zone. Do you see that? Now, what I'm getting is our target is, uh, our target is to, to show these areas of danger and make an effort to move into this zone, which we're going to define in a minute. Down here is a position... Or maybe you know some of the word, you're walking in very little of it. Maybe you know a whole lot more than you're doing. In fact, that's what it represents. Could be you knew clear up here, and you burn out and you move down to here. You're doing even less of it. Well, I just don't feel like worshiping anymore. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like praising. This is the area... of being dull of hearing. You've just about given up. You've been in church for years. You know the word. You know, you meet somebody, they'll say a, say a verse. You can, you can quote the verse. But you're not doing any of it. You're, you, you're just trying to go through the motions. You have no uh, desire for the anointings of gifts anymore because you've just been disappointed or you just... You're worn, you're worn out. You become weary in well-doing. You, you, you've burned out. And you move to the place of being dull of hearing. You just don't even, don't even listen anymore. That is a real dangerous place to be. Do you see this? Yes. So everything we've defined so far other than the bride zone is a dangerous place. Can you understand? And, and understand, I didn't define it, but we said 40% of Christianity is in the dead zone. I believe another at least 40% is in the tingle zone. Nobody's in the bride zone yet. That leaves a maximum, I believe, I think it's less than that, but I'm trying to be generous. A maximum of 20% of the church are in any position to even start moving toward the glory. And of that 20, 20%, I would venture to say 80% of that is in one of these zones. Which means right now in the worldwide church, the remnant faction that's really letting God get personal in them, let Him change them, that are, that are after the full counsel of God, the full Word of God, is a fraction of the Christian population. And we can have a mindset, well, I believe everybody's going in, but there are too many landmines out there and too many people have quit making themselves ready to be prepared to go in right now. That's why I believe God's going to bring a major revival to the world. An awakening to get people out of these zones. Especially this zone, to wake them up in this zone. Because these people, they already think they're there. Do you follow me? And these people most likely think they are, they're already there as well. And everybody else is just a flake. But these people, God wants to awaken to go into this region toward the glory. So then what are these two zones? Well, we've talked about this being a danger zone, a deception zone, a burnout zone. I call this a safe zone. <laughs> I mean, want to be in the safe zone. 
And what that means is you have a relationship with the Word and with going after the things of the Spirit where you're cycling somewhat in this region of keeping a balance between your Word, time, and your spiritual uh, uh, being Spirit-led. Do you follow me? I mean, when I was first saved, I didn't know how to be Spirit-led. I didn't know a whole lot of Word either. But as I built on the Word, God could lead me by the Spirit. And so God wants our growth process to be in this region here, going toward the glory. And not to get off balance one side or the other. And this is what God was showing me for the churches in the world. That most churches are going to fall into one of these categories. And the need to be able to examine yourself and decide where am I at on the chart? Where do I need to put some more emphasis to get back in balance? Well, I just really like to worship. Well, it could be you're too heavy in worship and not enough in the Word. You follow what I'm talking about? There must be an equality. So this is the safe zone of growth. That you're, you've got enough Word in you, you're not going to be deceived. You've got enough anointing in you, you're not going to burn out. And you're advancing toward the glory. You're not just parking. What do you think this zone would be? Anybody want to venture a guess beside Patty? Because I'm sure she remembers. <laughs> this is... Now, why would that be the safer zone, why do you think? Because you're more word-heavy than you are spirit-heavy. Follow me on this. Jesus as the Word on earth, coming to earth, preceded the Holy Spirit coming as the Comforter. The Word must always precede the Spirit. So this is an area of safer growth because you're advancing in Word and then you're applying it. You're advancing in Word and applying it. Versus up here, there's a danger. You're advancing in spirit and try to show it in the Word. And I'm telling you what, if you want to, you can show anything in the Word. And so this is, but either one of these is fine. And I believe most charismatics that are developing are growing in both of them. In other words, you're cycling along this somewhere. You know, you, there's, a, there's a season you focus on the Word. But then you go, well, I need to move up in the gifts. I need to move up in the noise. You focus on the Word, and God's got your growth going into that bride zone. Now, I even have another uh, piece I want to add to this. In Ezekiel chapter 47, uh, God said there's a river flowing out from under the temple of God. He showed Ezekiel this river. And He said, it's, actually, if you read it, you're going to discover this river is the outpouring of God's glory. The outpouring of his spirit in the end times. And he says, Ezekiel measured out. He says, first the waters were to my ankles. Then they were to the knees. Then to the loins or the waist. Then he says, they were risen waters to swim. In other words, it's the depth of the spirit of God being poured out. How much are we able to walk in at any, at any point in time? And so the water being poured out represented a passage of time. And God through time is increasing the depth of the spirit we can walk in. So I just define this. Here's ankle. Uh, here's knees. Here's waist. This becomes also the swim region. And I want to swim. Do you see this so far? Now, can I just say a couple more things? It won't take me about an hour. Uh, I'm not going to try to ride on the board. It took me too long to ride it. I was going to Ghana, and I knew the, the uh, uh, theme of the conference was called a test of loyalty. And I get there, and God gives me this chart. And I had a stack of notes. I probably brought that tall of different possible sermons. I just thrown, I didn't take time to sort with them. I threw a bunch of them. I thought maybe would apply in the... My, my 
bag. And God gives me this whole chart. At least I'm, I'm, I believe he gave it to me. I'm writing it down that night. And uh, so then, I think it was about a day later, I'm going through my notes to see what else I had. And I ran across this sheet. It's dated 13th of December, 2013. And it's, it's a revelation God gave me. I don't know if I ever preached or not. I just wrote it on a sheet of paper. And somehow... This ended up in all my notes of covenant and divine order. It has nothing to do with it. I don't know how it ended up in that stack. I've not seen this sheet in five years. But what it is, I'll hold it up here and you can read it from there. <laughs> I'll let these guys... The, the title was Fully Fueled Christianity. And on one side, it, each side represents two different revivals that have taken place over the past half century. A charismatic revival that really, I think, was birthed with the Jesus movement back in the hippie days. And the Jesus movement, the, the charismatic revival, was a, was a movement of the Spirit. It emphasized praise. It exercised the gifts in an amplified excitement. Then also, simultaneously, was another word, or another uh, revival that took place. I think Kenneth Copeland was one of the key people that initiated this one and he's been in our ministry for like 50 years in fact just over 50 years and it was a word revival we have a spirit revival and a word revival in the word revival teaching is emphasized faith manifestation is exercised and overcoming the curse is amplified and in 2013 God sh this is titled God showed me he's putting the two revivals together in the end times and producing the bride church where praise and the word are emphasized the gifts and manifestations by faith are exercised and the glory is amplified and that ended up in my notes which is really a representation of word and spirit coming together for the glory that I forgot all about and somehow God had as a confirmation to me Oh, he was showing me what he's doing in these end times. Now, did you guys follow that this morning? Heck, you okay with this chart today? Yep. Okay, we want to be one of these. <laughs> Charts and what? Are confusing? Uh, computing, I got you. I thought you said confusing. I thought, okay. And so, I believe God's got you and churches like this church all around the world that are laying aside tradition they're laying aside competitive mentalities then they're saying I've got to go into the kingdom I've gone into the glory and everything else can take a hike I'm living my life fully for him and he's got us on a path of development where he's given us the master key to reach inside and make the internal changes necessary to go to this glory this is the line of living in the master key do you follow me? did you get anything out of this? thank you Pastor Bob